and bear with me as I explain the concept of promises because it could be a little challenging sometimes, but the problem we're working on tonight is 2723 add two promises. So given two promises, promise one and promise two, return a new promise. Promise one and promise two will both resolve with a number. The returned promise should resolve with the sum of the two numbers. And so what we have, oh, let me delete this before Daniel cheats. <laughs> it's just fine. I'm surprised you didn't catch that, Daniel. Usually, usually, <laughs> usually when I leave a solution in there, you're like, uh, Jim, hey, delete no. it. <laughs> just playing um, all right so the input for the first one we have promise one and we have promise two so they created a promise um, they're only passing in resolve there's no possibility of the promise rejecting with promises the promise is either going to be in one of three states either pending if it has not yet returned a value Resolve if it did return without an error or reject if it encountered an error. So this promise is just going to run a method called set timeout, which is going to wait two milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. And then it's going to resolve with the value two. The second promise is same thing. It's going to resolve. There's no possibility of it rejecting and it's just going to run the set timeout so after 60 milliseconds it's going to resolve with five as a value the output is going to be seven um and so the two input promises resolve with the values of two and the value of five respectively the returned promise should resolve with the value of two plus five equals seven the time the return promise resolves is not judged for this problem. Doesn't even matter. Um, so I just want to show you guys a visual really quickly and just talk about promises and the way that it was a little bit with this really cool visual that I found. Um, so before there were promises, there were callbacks and there was something called callback hell because right here you're only seeing four nested functions, but sometimes there was like 10 or more and depending on the code editor you're using it becomes a triangle and it's just the code doesn't look good and so you can see in this picture the main function is get image this function takes two arguments the first argument is a, a string so the location of the image and the second one is a function it's a callback function. And so if get image is able to find an image in this location, then it takes that image and it passes it into the callback function. So it's going to so inside this fun inside this callback function we'll have access to the image or the error depending on whether it succeeds or it doesn't succeed. The first thing they do is they check if there's an error. If there's an error, they just throw an error. They handle the error. If there's not an error, they know they got an image. And so we got the image. Now we want to compress the image. So this compress image takes two arguments, image and another callback function. And so if they're able to compress the image with the image that was passed into the function. Then inside here, inside the compressed image function, we'll have access to the compressed image. Otherwise, it'll have access to the error. If, if an error happens, compressed image will be undefined. If there's a compressed image, error will be undefined. So the first thing they do is they check if there's an error. If there is one, they throw the error. And if there's not, then there's a compressed image in here being handled. And so they run another function, apply filter. And this apply filter function takes 
two arguments. One is a compressed image and one is a callback function. The callback function also has a successful and an unsuccessful argument it passes in. They check for the error. If there's an error, it throws an error. If not, we know we have a, a filtered image. And so we have, we were able to get the image. We were able to compress the image. We were able to filter the image. Now we want to save the image. So we pass the compressed image into the save image function. We pass a callback into here. Either it resolves or it rejects. So either successful or unsuccessful. First thing you do is check if it's unsuccessful. You want to handle that. If it is successful and we did not encounter an error, then we just console.log successful. So that's the old way of doing things. Um, it just gets really ugly really quickly. It still has the same functionality as promises, but it's just ugly. It doesn't look good. It's less readable. Um, so they created something called a promise, which does the same thing that callbacks do. Like I said, it has three states. It has fulfilled, it has rejected, or it has pending. And so basically what happens is when you call a promise, and let me show you like a real world promise just so you can see this. Um, so if we go to web APIs, just MDM, let's go to fetch. Fetch is just how you fetch data in the browser, basically. Like if you want your website to fetch data from an external data source, you use the fetch API. And the fetch API is a, is a promise. Um, so you can see the fetch method takes one mandatory argument, the location that you're trying to fetch from, the path of the resource you want to fetch, and it returns a promise. So when you call the fetch method, before it returns anything, it's in the pending state. You're, you're waiting for something to respond. If it responds with the data, then it's resolved. If it doesn't respond with the data, it's been rejected. Um, so that's just a real world example of a promise that if, if you're newer, um, this will probably be one of the first APIs you use. So if we go down here, I just wanted to show you the event loop. Thing. Um, so this is like a, a, a promise here where you have your function get image, you pass the file in, and then you return a new promise. This way, when you run this get image file, instead of having all these callbacks, you could just add a dot then onto it. And you'll see this. So you could do get image, pass in the file name, and then you can see how much more clean this is. So you run it and then then you have access to the image and you can continue running more promises like they did up here with the callbacks or you could just handle the image that you got. Um, so if you get the data, if, if you call the get image function, it resolves, you actually get the data, then you run the then, then block. But if it's an error, it'll run the catch block. So if it doesn't get the data that you're requesting, it'll run catch, and you can handle the error whatever way you want to handle that error. So you can see here, if it's rejected, then the value is going to come back undefined, and you're not going to have anything to handle. So you don't run the then, you run the catch. Um, and what was the? So this is exactly like the callback that we saw in the beginning, get image, compress image, apply filter, save image, console.log, and then catch at the end. If at any time in any of these methods uh, or functions, you get an error, then it'll just drop right down to the catch and it'll throw the error. So you can see how much cleaner this is than this, like this just, it's so unreadable and you're writing the same code like four times you know so it's just it doesn't look good so promises fix that problem there where this just looks way better you run the first one this first one returns a promise since it returns a promise you just do dot then this one returns a promise so dot then returns a promise dot then so promises allow you to just 
um, continue stringing on methods. Uh, where was the? Okay, so this is where we get to the event loop and the call stack. This is a really good visualization for people who are newer to the event loop. Um, so basically, let me see. Here we go. So you have your program, right? And you're running your program. Let's just say this box right here is your JavaScript file. And you run console.log start because your JavaScript file is going to start from the top. It's going to work its way down to the bottom. So the first thing they do is it puts the console.log onto the call stack and it executes that. It goes in the call stack and it prints start. Then you move down to the set timeout. Set timeout goes to the call stack. Set timeout is a web API. So it passes that call back to the web API. And that web API is passed to, um, passed to the macro task queue. So the set timeout is passed to the micro task queue for the length of the set timeout. So for anyone who knows set timeout, it's basically a function that takes a function and a number. The function is what you want to, to happen and the number is um, how long you want to wait before you execute the function. It's basically like a pause, like, hey, do this stuff, but wait this long to do it. And so after it does it, it puts it in the queue. So if it says like console.log timeout and this zero was actually like uh, 20,000, then it would be 20 seconds before the event loop accepted it back in um, or longer, depending if there's other things to do. So with the promise, promise is the same thing. Promise goes to the call stack the you want to continue running your program while the promise is out there being handled by the browser or by the operating system and so what the promise does is the promise passes it to the operating system to handle it whether it's like fetching or whatever your function is doing after it returns so whether it was resolved or rejected then the event your program is going to accept whatever returns from the promise so there's times where a promise could be out there just in netherland for a minute or five minutes and then whatever was supposed to return returns and it continues running in your program um, so a promise is basically like it's a promise that that um that there's a potential there's a potential for data to come back to your program but there's also a potential for an error or a rejection to come back to your program so you want to handle that rejection if if it doesn't resolve properly and then console.log and that just stays on the call stack so there's some operations like console.log that just are handled by the call stack handled by the event loop you never have to pass them anywhere else but then things like set timeout and promise they're actually the event loop is going to continue running while other parts of the browser or operating system handle your set timeouts and promises and then after the amount of time that's waited or after the promise returns then they'll come back into the event loop um, And then async await is the newest feature for promises, and this just cleans it up so much better than even before. So let me see if I can find. Um, no, I was hoping that re she recreated the promise with the, the image example with async await, but she didn't. Um, so basically what's going to happen in this problem is we have two promises. We have promise one and we have promise two. And so this one is going to be 20 milliseconds before it returns. This one's going to be 60 milliseconds before it returns. But we need to handle it in a way where we don't continue running the rest of the program until these promises return. So there's a few different ways we could do it. Does anyone feel comfortable enough to give it a shot? If not, I'll go into the 
several different solutions for something like this? Yeah, I, I, I think I solved it already. Okay, cool. I'd like to try it. I've been, I've been paying attention to this point. Okay, cool, cool. Forking shirt? Hey. Hey, it's actually Liz. I don't know how to change uh. <laughs> I think you can change how you put it in there. Uh, I think so. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've never changed someone else's name. They always just change it for themselves. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I've always had it changed, but anyway, working shirt is like the church name. All right, and you're Joy, right? You said it was in J O Y J O Y E though. Yeah, I thought she said it was a little bit different. All right, cool. Nice. I haven't done that before. It's funny when someone's brand new to Discord and they're like, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. I'm like, man, I've been using it for like two years. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> All right, cool. So Liz, how do you feel about promises or giving a shot? Or do you want me to break it I down? I would like to observe, yeah. I'm more familiar with like async await. Okay, cool. That's what I use. And like, you know, when you do like a get call to an API and stuff, but okay yeah okay cool cool i got you um all right so i have three different methods for solving this problem here the first one is a regular function let me go to let me actually invite everybody into my code editor for those who want to join and code along otherwise feel free to just look at my screen um so I just posted the link in the chat. If you click that, you'll get a couple pop-ups asking if you want to sign in as a guest or sign in through GitHub and Visual Studio Code. Um, either one works, honestly. If you sign in as through a guest and then you sign in as anonymous, it's usually quicker because you don't have to do any sign-ins, but either way works. So the first one I did was I used a regular function that I actually returned a promise from. And so the method that I used here is promise dot all. And what promise dot all does is promise dot all takes an array of promises. This is a newer feature that I just started using recently. And it returns um, each promise, each um, resolve promise in an array. So you'll return an array of resolved promises. So for example, if I pass in promise one, promise two, I'll get back result one, result two. If at any time in this promise.all method, one of my promises reject and get an error, then it'll actually break out of the promise.all and it won't, it won't finish um, resolving even, like let's say you have 10 promises and the third one rejects, it'll stop. It'll stop right there, you won't get the other seven. And so you have to handle the errors, that's just a side note for this promise.all method. Um, so basically what I do is I run promise.all with my array of promises and then I tack on a then. So let me go ahead and just build this slowly. So I know that since this is a regular function and the problem is asking for me to return a promise, I'm gonna have to return promise.all and I'm passing in an array with promise one and promise two. Now, after this promise.all method runs this promise and runs this promise, like this one might take 20 milliseconds, this one might take 60 milliseconds, depending, they're all gonna take a different amount of time. So this method is actually gonna wait for, for all of the promises in here to resolve. When it does, then I could do something else. 
And then, inside this then, I'm gonna have the response from this promise as well. So I'm gonna have access to all of the promises that have returned from here, and I'm gonna call those just values for now. So let me go ahead and just console.log out values so you can see what that is. And so if I go ahead and just run, let me comment these out. So if I run some promises, so this method right here with promise one and promise two. So with these two promises, I should get a promise back because I'm returning a promise here. Uh, but let's see what we console.log out for values. So you can see, I get an array of values. I get I get two resolved promises. One resolved to two, one resolved to five. So I actually want to return the sum. Um, so in here, instead of actually console.logging values, I want to find the sum of values. And so I'm going to store the values inside of a sum. And the best method to iterate over an array of values to find their sum so if I have two and five, I basically want to take this two. I want to add it to five. So I'm going to use reduce. I have my total and I have my value. And I'm just going to do total plus value and I'm going to start at zero. So basically what this reduce method is doing is it is finding the total of this array right here but it's starting it at zero so the zero that i'm passing in is the second argument you can see if you look at reduce i'm passing in two arguments the first argument is a function that takes a total and a value the value is just the current element and then it adds the total to the value. This zero is saying initialize total is zero. So total is gonna be zero on the first iteration and value is gonna be two. So it's gonna add zero to two and now total equals two. And so it runs again because we have one more element in our array. So this time total equals two and the current element or value equals five so total plus value, two plus five equals seven. And since that was the last element, if there was more elements, then we'd continue doing total plus value with value as the current element until we're out of elements. But since there's only two elements, then it returns, stores seven inside of sum, and then I could just return sum. So if I go ahead and run this here, you can see I get back seven. And what this is looking for is seven. And then, so the reason why I'm returning right here is because they want me to return a promise um, and this is, this is returning my promise essentially. Now, what some, someone, I think it was a uh, lizard joy said that they've dealt with async await. And so in that case, instead of just creating a regular function that returns a promise like this, we're going to turn this function into an async function. It's not, a uh, regular function that returns a promise. It's just, you're, you're saying that it returns, you're saying that this function returns a promise without actually returning it explicitly just by putting this async, asynchronous keyword on this function. Um, so this is the second method here. And in this case, this is super, super easy to read and understand. So we're just awaiting for promise one to return. Value two, await promise two, and then the 
return value plus value two. And that's clean. I mean, if you look at the difference between one, which is, it just looks nested. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five. I guess five lines of code versus three, so you're saving yourself two lines. It just looks cleaner. It looks better. This is so beautiful compared to the other one. Because when you start working with files of, or functions of like, you know, if there's 30 lines in a function, this 30 lines would end up being like 80 lines for this, you know? So it starts looking a lot better if you use yeah, async I'll, away. I'll like to point out the difference too. Um, in file one, you're yeah. using promise.all, right? Yes. Um, I know that because I've worked with promises before. Uh, if any one of those promises fail, the whole thing fails. Yes. So that's, that's something that, you know, I think it's important to, to point out. In case two, uh, if, even if one of them fails, the other one uh, is going to succeed. Of course, the result is going to be messed up. But, um, you know, they're not bound together. Mm hmm Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. That's something to definitely keep in mind with promise dot all. Um, versus this, this you if one of the promises rejects and you don't get the number and it ends up being undefined or an error, you're still not going to get set it. Yeah, but I guess regardless, it's it's not good. You want your promise to resolve instead of reject. But if it does reject, you can handle the error. Um, yeah, I guess you can handle the error here with a catch and a finally block, but still, you just want them to resolve at the end of the day.